Hey guys, today on The Interview Show, part two of my interview with John David Mann, uh, author of such great books as The Go-Giver, Total Focus, and the brand new book, it's a book about cooking and about success and about life. It's The Recipe with John David Mann coming up. John David Mann, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here, Tim. Great having you here. You and I just had our discussion of all our dogs running around, and there may be barking and all kinds of things in the background. Welcome to my world, man. This is there it. Will <laughs> there will be bark. Yes. Excellent. Well, hey, I uh, appreciate you taking the time out. I know how busy you are, but I actually have been wanting to meet you for a while. Bob Berg is an old mutual acquaintance of mm -hmm. ours, so uh, looking forward to having you on the show talking about writing your books, your new book, of course, but uh, before we get started, give the audience just a really quick background on you. Sure. Um, so I was born in the 16th century. And, uh, <laughs> this no, time. Not that, long, not that long ago. Um, my life has been odd, my professional life. I've gone through sort of a series of careers, none of it planned. Um, you know, it, I don't think it was John Lennon who first said, life is what happens when you're making other plans. But it is definitely true. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 come from a musical family. My father was a choral conductor of some renown and a musicologist. And uh, that's what, that was my career. But I, I became dissatisfied as a teenager. Um, as a kid of 17, I was unhappy with my school. And a bunch of friends and I, I dropped out of school. And a, friend, a bunch of friends and I started our own high school. And so I became an entrepreneur and educator at the age of 17. Mm -hmm. It was a great school. It ran on for a decade. We graduated students and went to universities and so forth. So that was my first entrepreneurial experience. Mm -hmm. As a classical musician, I, I was dissatisfied with that career. It felt narrow to me. I wanted to reach more people with, with just more good stuff. And I got involved in, uh, in education. I got involved in marketing. I became a business person. And I ended up, really, Tim, I mean, just a little over a decade ago, um, you know, close to, close to the age of 50, I found myself in a career as, uh, as an author. And that's what I do. And I love it. Um, but it took a lot of permutations to get here. Well, you know, when I was in high school as a teenage boy, I started a band. I didn't start a high school. Ah. So, but you, you actually, you were, were you a cellist? You, yes. you really, music was a very big part of your life in the beginning, right? Very, very it was, it was my everything. Mm -hmm. And that was from your dad? Yep, dad. Well, how did, how did you morph from musician, entrepreneur, uh, and then a few years ago you started, uh, started writing? How did that happen? You know, it, it happened like this. Uh, from music, I got involved in nutrition and natural health and that whole field. I was macrobiotic in Boston, Massachusetts for a decade. And, and in that field, and in every field I went into after that, it only seemed like I landed in situations where there were newsletters or journals or periodicals that people needed to write for and, and someone needed to edit something. I, I mm. seemed to be the guy that ended up editing stuff. So I spent a lot of years editing. I uh, got involved in the world of network marketing and direct selling. I became editor in chief of, you know, sort of the premier journal in that field. And then I became editor in chief of a few other journals in that field. So I, I backed into a writing career as an editor, which in retrospect is actually a great way to learn how to write, mm -hmm. is prove other people's writing. Um, and so I, I spent decades as an editor, both sort of moonlighting and very much in the side to eventually becoming my full-time profession. And from there, it, it, it merged into ghostwriting or co-writing. And co-authoring, my business model, you may know this already, my business mm -hmm. model basically is this. I partner with, with really interesting business partners. I write the book, they sell the book. And that's kind of how it's, how it's worked up until this latest book, which we'll talk about. Right, exactly. So, but you must have had some natural talent as a writer. I mean, I understand what you're saying about, about being an editor first, because I'm, I'm an old editor. And, you know, you and I both know most writers can't edit themselves, right. much right. less anyone else. Yeah. But there must have been some natural talent on your part to, to, to get there and to do it. I mean, you've been really prolific the last, what, 10 years or so? You've, you've cranked out a lot of books. A lot of books, a lot of books. Yeah, it, it is kind of a native language for me. My, my dad was a college professor, a musicologist, and, and taught at Rutgers in New Jersey. My mom was a teacher, English teacher, history, mythology, big and Greek mythology. So there's a lot of teaching and writing in my family. Mm -hmm. um, so it, music was, was my native language. 
um, the, the world of academia and writing was probably my second language growing up. So it, it did kind of come naturally to me. And I love words. I love writing. Yeah. Well, you, you know, you, you, you say that, I guess opportunities just kind of, they, I, what the, what's the old saying when you least appear, expect them, opportunities appear. Something like and, that. And I, I think that, uh, you know, from what I know about you and what, what you're saying, that's kind of what happened along the way. You were, you know, head down, plowing along, and then these opportunities came along to do these uh, ghost-written projects and, and partnering projects. Talk a little bit about that because, you know, it's, it's hard to write a book by yourself. A lot of people think it's harder to write with a collaborator. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Um, you know, it's funny because I've, you know, I have one book that I wrote myself, which is really a collection of editorials that I wrote over years. So it's not really a full book that I wrote. Um, other than that, I haven't actually not, I have not written a full length book all by myself. I will right. one of these days. I can't wait to find out what it's like. But I love my work as a collaborator. Mm -hmm. um, to me, the choice of a, of a, of a business, of, well, of a collaborator, I mean, my philosophy is this. Every book is two things. It is a book. That is to say, it's a vehicle through which I hope to express ideas, thoughts, experiences that I hope will touch other people's lives and in some small measure change the world. Mm -hmm. That's what a book is for me. But every book is also a business. So in a sense, I've published more than, 20, than two dozen books in the last decade. I've also launched two dozen businesses right. in the last decade. And, and these businesses need to not only support me, but also they're building my retirement. They're supporting my family. I mean, the business aspect is really important to me. On a book level, I'm not answering your question yet, but I'm going to get there, I promise. Take your time. We got plenty of time. On a book level, I can happily say I consider every one of my books a success. Mm -hmm. I, I'm proud of every one of them. Every single title I've done, I've had people come back to me and, and say that it touched them you know, in, a, in a significant way. It impacted their life. It changed their life in some way. I'm proud of every book I've done. Everyone's been a success. Mm -hmm. As a business, most of them are failures. <laughs> <laughs> Explain like, the difference there. Yeah. It's, it's like if I, if I started a restaurant, I love to cook. My wife and I love to cook together, mm -hmm. which plays into this latest book. But I, let's say you love to cook. And everyone says, man, your cooking is so amazing. You should start a restaurant. So you do. You start a restaurant. You raise, up the, you raise the money. You get some investors. You start this restaurant. And people come and they love it. Your friends say, oh, my God, Tim, I'm so glad you finally did this. And they tell their friends and their friends tell their friends. And the place is mobbed. And you get some good reviews. And two years later, it sh you shutter the place. Mm -hmm. The doors close. Because mm -hmm. you're a great cook but maybe you're not a great entrepreneur or yeah. for whatever reason, the restaurant didn't work. Well, the restaurant business, it happens all the time in the book business. This happens all the time to me. The definition of a success of a book as a business, not as a book, as a book, there's a whole different set of criteria if it's successful or not, but as a business to me, it's successful. If it makes back its monetary investment and then continues to pay royalties. A business has to make back my advance if I got an advance or an investment if it's, if it's self-published and then continue to pay me royalties. I only have a handful of books that have done that. The Go-Giver books, the, they're successful. Mm -hmm. Some of my books with, with my Navy SEAL sniper buddy, Brandon Webb, mm -hmm. those have been successful. Mm -hmm. A lot of my other books, a few are paying a little trickle of royalties, but most of them, they never even earn back their advance. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's to me the financial side of things. And I didn't answer your question, which was, which was, you know, what's the collaboration like, but we, we can get into that too. Yeah. Well, I, I really like where you went with that though, because I talk a lot on this show about the business side of writing because I'm like, like you, I was a 30 year entrepreneur who was also a writer and I, I kind of cut my teeth writing a newspaper column for many years and mm -hmm. then started writing, uh, you know, primarily mysteries. I wrote one business advice book back in 05 and had my fill of that. Uh -huh. uh, but I always, like you, I approached it as a business. To me, I, I was an entrepreneur who was also a writer. Yes. Is that what you considered yourself to be an entrepreneur first? And you looked at the, the marketing and business side of every project before diving in? Uh, no, I mean, I was, I was mm -hmm. an entrepreneur for many years, but I don't consider, you know, what I would consider myself as a writer first. Okay. And, and I've, I've worn the costume of an entrepreneur for years. I played one on TV <laughs> and, and I, and I have to assume that role and I'm assuming that role now. And, and actually I love it. I am, 
I am at heart an entrepreneur. I've only worked for a steady paycheck in a job where I went to work every morning once in my life for mm -hmm. like a few months. And I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> I'm not very employable. So I, I really am temperamentally an entrepreneur. But, you know, I'm a cellist, man. It's like yeah. I'm at heart. Uh, a, a classical musician. And, and so the craft of writing, the expression of writing, the impact of writing, what I am in my soul is a writer, mm -hmm. but I happen to live in an entrepreneurial, in an entrepreneurial context. Um, I, I, by the way, you said you write mysteries, man. You know, what's interesting. It's all I read. It's like, I read, I don't read. I'll, I'll send you a couple of books that will make wonderful doorstops. I've, I, I've written a ton of, of nonfiction books, business books and business, people's memoirs, as you know, about the parables, which mm -hmm. is what I love most. Mm -hmm. But I don't read any of those. I, when I wrote <laughs> The Vote Giver with Bob Berg, the only parable I'd read was The One Minute Manager, and that's about it. Um, I never read The Greatest Salesman in the World or, you know, The Richest Man in Babylon or, mm -hmm. you know, or the, the Alchemist or The Little Prince. I never read any of them. So what I read, what I love to read is great great crime fiction. Well, Thank there will be a couple in your mailbox uh, soon. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. um, you, you mentioned Bob Berg and Go-Giver. You know, uh, when, when I was doing entrepreneurial training for many years, Go-Giver, that whole series were books that I, I recommended. And this mm -hmm. was before I, I had met and interviewed uh, Bob. And I, what is it about that book? Or, you know, especially the, the first one that has such, it, it struck such a chord with folks. I mean, it's right up there with, you know, E-Myth and Who Moved My Cheese and Rich Dad. It's, it's mm -hmm. always on those lists. Uh, first of all, talk about how, how the book came to be, how your partnership with Bob began, and then tell us about the writing of that book. Bob ruined my career. <laughs> damn him. Yeah, damn you, Bob. <laughs> What happened was I was all set in 2003, 2002, 2003, 2004. I was on my way to become a Hollywood screenwriter. Mm. I had studied screenwriting extensively. I, I had written a few screenplays, one of which I'm actually proud of. And um, I, I'd been out to Hollywood a few times. I had some connections. That was my deal, man. That was my plan. And Bob came along and said, um, at the time I was working as an editor for, for a business journal, and I had edited Bob a bunch. And so we knew each other through that. And Bob came to me and said, I have this idea for a book. I had edited two books of his. He said, I have this idea for a book, but I can't write this book. I don't want you to edit this book. I need you to write this book with me. So it's the, the idea is this, the go-giver. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. the go-getter, but it's, but it's the go-giver. So it's kind of a twist on that. And the idea is, you know, you, 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 uh, you focus on giving value, you focus on the other person, you take the post call off yourself. And it's not only a nice thing to do, but it's also a, a, a practical, strategic, and business-wise advantageous. Mm -hmm. He gave me the premise of the book. And he had written a bunch. He had written drafts of a couple chapters. He had some characters. He had some. So he had a bunch of paper. And he said, I, I can't do this. This is not what I do. Will you do this with me? And I was like, I don't have time for this. <laughs> and I, I'm going to Hollywood, Bob. I'm going to Hollywood, baby. <laughs> and also, I'm busy. I was starting to, I was, had a couple of ghostwriting gigs. And I was editing and writing a few people's books. So I was already, had my toe in the, in the book world. But it was Bob. And I said to my wife, then my fiance, I said, you know, it's Bob, so I should give it a look. So mm -hmm. I give it a look. And I, honestly, Tim, I didn't see it. Uh, I didn't see the book's potential, but it was Bob. So I said, okay, I'm going to give it a shot. So I went, I went one Christmas. Uh, we went and visited him at his home. We talked for an afternoon. I came home and that January, I sat down and I drafted a chapter. Chapter of scenes, the scene with Deborah Davenport, where she gives this speech in a big auditorium. And she has a lot of fun with her speech. And I had a lot of fun writing her speech. And I wrote that thing and I thought, oh my God, this is this, this is gonna work. Mm -hmm. And we we did it. Uh, I would write drafts on my computer and I would email them to him and he would bounce back thoughts and ideas. We did it in under six weeks. Oh wow. Then mm -hmm through a, a whole nother story, I happened to have a connection to an agent, which is one of those sort of out of left field situations, um, who I promised to, to write a book for a friend if he would connect me to his agent. And the book never happened, the friend disappeared, but I did connect him to the agent, who was Spencer Johnson's agent. And Spencer Johnson's One Minute Manager was the book mm -hmm. that had inspired us. So I sent her the book, she loved it, she wanted to represent us, she represented us, she took it to New York, and we were rejected by about um, a dozen, 15 publishers. We finally took it back and, and 
my agent started editing it and she covered every page with red. And we took it for about nine months and completely revised it. Basically, simplified, 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 mm -hmm. stripped away. I did a lot more subtraction than addition. Threw out the last chapter, wrote a new last chapter, threw out some sections, changed one character from a man to a woman. We made some major changes to the book, took it back to New York, another dozen rejections, and publisher number 22 said, I like this. Mm. And that was Adrian Zakheim in Portfolio. And mm. so it got published in 2008. And it's, it's done better every year ever since. It, it's one of those books. It, it really does just, it's, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And I think one of the things that I really like about it and what I hear is it's, it's very evergreen. Yeah. You know, that book is just as relevant today as it was when you wrote it. How many, how many uh, books in that series has there been now? There have been three, um, and we're about to come out with a fourth. Uh, one, two of them are parables, like the first one, and then The Go-Giver Leader is also mm -hmm. a story. We're about to come out with another one, The Go-Giver Influencer, and then there's a sales book, which is not a parable. It's sort of a companion volume. And, um, you know, I, I think that it did touch a chord, the whole concept mm -hmm. of, of giving, not as an altruistic, noble, self-sacrificing thing, but as a way of life that is pragmatic and profitable as well as nice and noble and altruistic. Right. Yeah. Right. That you can do well and do good. Do good and do well. I think that touched a chord. What we heard from a lot of people was, we, we, we don't hear a lot of people saying, wow, I never thought of this. What people say is, this is what I always thought, but mm -hmm. I never had to put it in words. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it's one of those books, it, it, especially in the society that we live in and all of the crap that goes on daily, it's one of those books that says, hey, it's, it's okay to give back. Yeah. You know, you don't have to be completely self. I got mine, you get yours. It's, you know, let me, let me get mine by helping you get yours. I thought that was a really, a really good lesson. Is that what you hear from it a lot? We hear uh, a couple different things. Um, one thing we hear a lot of is we hear a lot of people say, you know, I don't really read books. Mm -hmm. Or I might read a book now and then, but it's hard. I don't, I don't read easily, but I couldn't put this down. So we hear that a lot. And so that's very gratifying, obviously. But here's what I take from a lot of what we've heard in the last decade. Um, there's, to me, there's, as a writer, there's a delicate balance here in a, in a parable or a fable because, mm -hmm. um, or, or sort of a, a parable-like novel, like The Alchemist or Life of Pi or something like that is that, you know, part of the idea of a parable is that you have characters stripped down to their basics. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in The Go-Giver, the main character's name is Joe. Well, what color is Joe's hair? What is Joe's last name? Well, you don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know either. Um, th the whole idea of a parable is that the characters can, can be very, uh, uh, can be stand-ins. So you, you have very little in the way of specifics. Mm -hmm. That's the whole idea. But, but at the same time, you got to have a real emotional experience with this book. Right. A lot of people tell us, I hate parables. There's a lot of parable hate out there because a mm -hmm. lot of parables are just thinly disguised lectures. Mm -hmm. They're just somebody saying, I want to teach you this idea that I have. So I'm going to slap on the name is Bob and Sally and call it a book, call it a story. And it's not. Right. It's a two dimensional, dry, boring lecture with some names Bob and Sally on it. For the, for the story to work, and this is obviously true of any, anything from an 800-page novel to a blog post, it needs to be emotionally involving. Mm -hmm. and so we, the characters in the, we needed the characters in The Go-Giver to come to life. For that, they had to come to life for me. And that, to me, has been sort of my study in how to write these stripped-down stories so that they're simplified, they're simple, they're easy to read. People who don't read books can read them but they don't feel dumb. They feel rich. They feel real. They feel involving. They're, they're, you even, uh, we get people who cry, you know, when they read some of these books sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's, that to me has been one of the prime reasons that the series has really taken off and done well. Let's talk a little bit about that parable form because you're, you're right. I think a lot of the, the parable books, they, they come across as preachy and just thinly veiled PowerPoints to right. me. Right. You know, in my mind, the best parables, and, and you're the, one of the best writers of, of that genre, is you, you think almost you're reading a, a story of fiction. You're not really being taught a lesson. You know, you're just enjoying a story. And, right. and 
you know, talk about that for the writers out there. And, and I talk to a lot of them that are thinking about writing in that parable genre. Um, it's not as easy to do and, and pull off as a lot of people think. How do you do it so effectively? Yeah. So, for example, in The Go-Giver, there's a character called The Connector. Mm -hmm. And at first, you don't know who it is. In fact, this, hap this is like sort of a theme recurring throughout the book. It's like Joe keeps guessing who this person is, and, and you don't know who it is. And in fact, there, there are a whole number of reversals and sort of little mini mysteries in the story. And, you know, the reason that they're there is because they're there for me. It's because I, I, I told you, I like to read crime novels. I like to read mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I love that stuff. I love when I'm reading something and I, and I can't figure it out, but I know that there's an answer in there. And so um, the thing of, of discovery and revelation and new layers to something and not revealing all the information in the go-giver So that they have a child who died many years ago. Right. And you don't learn that until like 80% of the way through the book. Mm -hmm. But once you learn it, you realize it's kind of colored who they are. Because I didn't blurt it out in the first two chapters. Um, those basic principles of narrative, of, of when you reveal something, of where the depth is to something, of layering, to me, those are even more important in a parable in a way than they are in a novel. Um, mm -hmm. and so... To, the way, so to get to your question, the goal giver is based on what we call the five laws of stratospheric success. When I started writing the book, when we started working together on it, we didn't have five laws of strength. We didn't have five anything. We didn't have that mapped out. We didn't have an outline. Now, mm -hmm. I'm an outliner. I like outlines. But we didn't have one for the goal giver. For the goal giver leader, we sort of did. But... What, one of my principles in parable writing is don't start with the principles. The idea of a parable is it's going to be a story that teaches some principles. Mm -hmm. That's what a parable is, a story that teaches some principles. You can't let the principles guide the writing. You have to let right. the story guide the writing, mm -hmm. which means the characters and the situation. Um, so Bob and I just finished writing a book. It's going to be called The Go-Giver Influencer. It's going to come out next year. I already knew what the principles were before we started, but I had to put them off to the side. And we, we, it, it, there and there are two characters, and we decided to start with a double protagonist. So two, two storylines going that way and two mentors, and there's a dog and there's a cat, and it was a lot of fun. But you have to really tell the story and let and let – you can't, I think – you can't outline the whole story. You have to leave room for is someone mm -hmm. going to die? Is there going to someone going to be born? Is something going to is there going to be a failure? Is there going to be? You have to let it be a little bit unfinished to allow the story to tell itself some when you're in the process of it. John, I like what you're what you're saying about uh, letting the characters kind of tell the story. And that's really a, a rule of thumb that you know, old fiction writers use. Yeah. I'm, I'm like you, I'll start out with a general outline, but very much I write by the seat of my pants. And I'm typically, I go where the characters take me. Mm -hmm. And I let the characters talk. Is that a hard thing for you to do when you're doing a, ver a parable? Is, is letting the character have a voice rather than just echoing your voice? You know, you have to let the characters stand, right? It, it, it actually, I, I'm going to say it isn't a hard thing to do. Okay. okay. What's, what's, challenging about it for me is that I have an outline mind. I like to outline. Mm -hmm. So I, I really have two ways of operating. You know, one is, I guess it's kind of a more left brain and a more right brain way, I suppose. Um, but what I have two modes for writing and the, the, everything I just said about the goal giver is, is true times 10 for the recipe for the new book, because yeah. it's a longer book and more novelistic. And we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. But I have two modes of writing. One mode is where I already have a bunch of content. Maybe I'm writing someone's memoir and I have a bunch of interviews with them. Or I, or I have a bunch of ideas from like Bob Berg or from my, my chef friend or whatever. I have stuff and I'm working with it. Um, the other mode though is that I have, I'll sit down in my armchair with a pad of blank paper and a pen and a cup of hot tea. And basically just close my eyes and say, okay, go. And what go means is I literally would just close my eyes and sort of like nothing happens. <laughs> <There's> nothing. <laughs> and I literally wait, not for inspiration. 
just I just wait for some idea to to get sparking in my mind, some star to shoot across mm -hmm. the black sky. And it, and often what it will be it, is it will be a snatch of dialogue. It'll be characters talking or it'll be a situation. And it may be something that I don't even know where it's going to be in the book. I do a spark and shoot process where I, I won't write linearly, linearly through the book, but I'll just start brainstorming crap. And some of it I'll keep and it'll go. I've been surprised sometimes that I, I, I might get 1% of my material in that process. Mm -hmm. The 99% of it is me at the computer sitting, d developing what I already have, building on it, riffing on it. But that 1% is going to be the best stuff in the book. It's yeah. going to be the stuff that ends up in the flap. Yeah, and that's the stuff that you, you usually go, wow, how did I come up with that? that? And why can't I do that more? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, let, let's talk about the, the new book, uh, uh, The Recipe. Tell us about the book. Uh, first, Audio visual aid. You know, I have mine, but it's in my reading library. <laughs> and that <laughs> illustration, it was a painting that I commissioned from a friend of mine who's a watercolor artist in Maine. Um, and it, it, it tells the story of the story in microcosm. But so the, how the recipe happened was an accident, but a fortuitous accident. Um, a friend of mine, well, a guy that I, I didn't know at all, an award-winning chef out in Texas, contacted me a year after The Go-Giver came out and said he was using The Go-Giver. Uh, in his country club. And this is a guy who has a staff of 75. He runs the food program for one of the busiest country clubs in the nation. It's in Houston. It's a very upscale country club. And he's got 75 employees, three kitchens, five restaurants. They host something like 800 banquet events per week. Oh my goodness. Mammoth organization that he runs. He's been to eight Olympics. He's won a numerous Olympic gold medals. There is a culinary Olympics every four years, just like the other Olympics. Mm -hmm. And so he was using the go-giver as a management tool in his, in his restaurants. He said, I have this idea for a story. <laughs> now, Tim. How, how often do you hear that, John? <laughs> <laughs> I would be rich if, mm -hmm. if the nickel. But, uh, but he had this idea for a story. And I, he, he told me his idea. And I was like, damn, I want to do that. I could see it. I could see it because it was like teaching personal development through lessons in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. I was hooked. And so his basic idea for the story, like Bob Berg, Charles, Charles Carroll had written out a bunch of draft material. He had some ideas. He had sort of a draft of a story. We threw out a bunch. We kept a bunch. We used that starting point. And that became our story. It took us eight years to get to the point where I actually had time in the schedule and he had time. In wow. Sat down for this maelstrom of two months activity wrote the book did a bunch of cooking in my kitchen trying out stuff and i all the cooking scenes i, I tried them all out in my i wrote them in my kitchen and um my agent took it and i figured okay agent's going to take it to new york she she read the draft and she said this is the best writing you've ever done she was screaming on the phone wow she and her staff were crying reading the manuscript. And she said, okay, this is, this is crazy. We're talking seven-figure advance. I'm taking this to New York. We're going to go to auction. So that was the plan. Go to New York, goes to auction, right? Bunch of publishers vying for it. Top one, seven-figure. It's going to be a, over 40 publishers read it and said no. God, wow. No publisher. Oh, what, what happened? So a bunch of editors uh, said this is great. I love this story. I love the characters. I love the life lessons. It doesn't fit our catalog. Mm. Uh, we're not even sure what catalog it does fit. They couldn't see what shelf in Barnes and Noble it fits on. Now, to me, this is a red flag. I've learned that you got to listen to critique from people who are qualified to give you the critique. Mm -hmm. and, and usually when someone who knows their market says to you, the thing that you've got doesn't fit anywhere in the marketplace, whether it's a script for a movie or it's a book or whatever it is, they could be telling you that's going to land like a thud. Yeah. But not always. Sometimes movies come out that don't fit anything, but they're huge. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that, you know, what, what is Slumdog Millionaire? What the hell was that? Um, uh, best Picture Oscar is what it was. Mm -hmm. uh, it happens with books all the time. Books that don't fit anywhere currently then becomes trendsetters. We believe we had a book that will work. It's a book for people who, who love personal development and parables. Mm -hmm. It's a book for people who are foodies and love about food. 
And it's about people who are both. And my experience is there's a lot of people who are both. That's who this book is for. So we decided to self-publish. And so that's what we're doing. That's the story. Let's talk a little bit about that because I, I have been traditionally published. You have been traditionally published many times. Yes. Uh, let's talk about the, the different sort of adventure that is self-publishing. Oh boy, yeah. Yeah, this is where we get tense. <laughs> yes. Talk, talk a little bit about that journey because it really is a completely different world. It was a big question for me. I, I, it was a long and hard soul search because what I don't want to do is, well, first of all, what neither Charles nor I have is the time, the budget, or the experience to do this. Mm -hmm. um, I have two books that are both clamoring with an August 1 deadline that I haven't written yet. Jeez. And we're speaking now in August. This is uh, October 1. That's really soon. Charles runs, I already told you about his job. Mm -hmm. We don't have time for this. Uh, that is to say, I don't have time to pour my full undivided attention 24 hours a day into this, which is what usually I like to do as an entrepreneur. Right. We don't have a big budget for it. Um, we don't have the experience. So, uh, and here's what I don't want. I don't want to self-publish a book that looks like a self-published book. Right. And we all know what that looks like. Mm -hmm. I don't want a book that acts like a self-published book. That is like it gets five Amazon reviews and you sell 400 copies and we, yeah, if, if you're lucky. That's not what I'm here for. Yeah. So I, I, the first thing was I had to find out, can I, can I practically do hardcover? Because call me crazy, but I don't like to do books that go direct to, 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 to paperback. I, mm -hmm. I'm sure it's a fine thing to do. Mm -hmm. but to me, a book that goes right to paperback is like a film that goes straight to video. I, I just, I, I, want it, I want it out there in hardcover for, for it to feel like a real book to me. Can I put out a hardcover? Can I put out an audio book, an ebook, and then later a paperback? Can I do all that practically as a self? And I found out much to my shock and surprise, Yes, the technology exists now. Through Ingram Spark, you can put out a POD, print on demand, hardcover, that looks and feels and acts like the real thing. This is a high quality hardcover here yep. that looks like any other hardcover. Fortunately, I have the skill to lay out books. I've been a book designer. I know how to use InDesign and make a book look like a real book. So I decided to do all the regular stuff. Um, I, I sent the book to Kirkus, Publishers Weekly, uh, you know, and all the regular review functions mm. pretended that I was a real publisher, even though they say, do not do that. They say, we do not accept self-published books. So I, I told them, I'm not a self-published book. I'm a publisher. And I, may, I had a friend make a publisher's website for me that kind of looks like the real thing. Mm -hmm. if, if your listeners know Remington Steel, that TV mm -hmm. show, mm -hmm. that's my Remington Steel. Um, <laughs> I found that every, I, I made up a, a sales sheet. I, did, I, I, I put on a show and pretended to be, I got my own colophon on the book. There it is right there. Yep. That is Austin David Books. That's my little colophon there. So we decided to put our best foot forward and, and be a self-published book. What we did not do was hire a publicist. You know, we did not do any of the big money stuff. Mm -hmm. So we're really relying heavily on a small handful of, of personal resources, social media, and so forth to get the word out there. And will it work? work? We don't know. We'll find out. Well, the, the beautiful part of it is you, you can find out. Yes. And Jesus, John, what a great story you're walking away with. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's a book in there, right? It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. <laughs> I'll tell you, the best thing we did, I think, was we created an advanced readers group. Yep. And I learned this from a few author friends of mine that we got really generous with. I have given away uh, almost 200 copies of the ebook to our readers group, and they're creating so much buzz you know, my goal is to have a hundred reader reviews on Amazon on day one. Yeah. That's my number one strategic goal. And you know, we'll see, I, I I'm going to shoot for it. Well, you know, I, and, and I, I may have a, a tainted way of looking at things because, you know, my books have been, you know, rejected as well. And I've done a lot of self publishing, but you know, by and large, the, the big publishing houses now, basically they're, they, they print and distribute. Yeah. That's unless you are Patterson or King or someone of that ilk, you know, you're going to have to do everything yourself anyway. Yes. You know, they will provide you with the book, but you've got to go out and market it. You've yes. got to go out and do all the hard work. You know, on my, my old interview show, I had interviewed a lot of New York Times bestsellers who uh, were, you know, were, were really big in the 80s and 90s. They've been, around, you know, uh, Mary Higgins Clark uh, and, and that sort. And this, this new self-publishing age where the author does more than just write baffles the crap out of them. 
Yeah. And so, you know, the, the lesson you're really learning really is it's, it's, a, it's a whole new world and you can do it all yourself. And the great thing about it is you've got a great product to try this out with in the book. So talk a little bit about the story uh, in the book really quickly. It's, um, it's, so it's sort of Karate Kid meets Master Chef. <laughs> I love that. We say it's a story of loss, love, and the ingredients of greatness. And the loss part is that it starts out with a young boy, 14 years old, who's just lost his dad. And his life is kind of spiraling down the drain. He's getting in trouble and an act of vandalism he's committed is what sets the story in motion. He goes to work for a, a you know, retired, crusty old diner chef to pay for having broken a window. And, and uh, the chef turns out to be the owner of the diner and it turns out to be a, a, a chef with a, with a fairly colorful storied past. And so a lot of the story is lessons in the kitchen, in this cramped little diner kitchen. And in the course of that, they, you know, they really become revealed as, as life lessons. So the chef has his seven rules of the kitchen. Uh, and in the end, they, they, they turn out to be sort of a, a recipe for, for living as well. So that's the thrust of the book. Um, and, you know, a lot of it is about, you know, when we say the ingredients of greatness, it is that parable aspect where it has these seven principles that you can use as principles for living and apply mm -hmm. in anything. But there's a lot of food and a lot of cooking. And there's a lot of actual hardcore, high-level chef detail in the cooking and so forth. So you, you, you're going to learn something about, about cooking. And we've got a section of recipes in the back. So all the main recipes in the story, you actually get them in the back. And we're going to put videos of of my, my, my co-author actually cooking some of those recipes on our on the book's website. Yeah, I, I was gonna, it's funny that you, you said that because I was going to ask you about all the add-ons that you can do to this book, you know, re recipe books, cookbooks. I saw some videos, I think, on, on Facebook of you and uh, Chef Charles, and yes. th there are a lot of things you can do. I mean, in my mind, John, this, this book is a seed that yeah. other things, uh, you know, can, can grow from. So uh, very, so. very cool. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Well, I just came back from, from Houston where I actually visited him and, and in his kitchen at home, which was the kitchen we based the kitchen in, in the chef's home in the book on, we actually did a whole, we got a video crew in, we did a whole bunch of demos and all that is to create content that we're never going to charge a penny for. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be for you know people who pre-order and eventually it'll probably be on the website and blah, blah. So yeah, I, I'm a big believer in, in, in bonus content. Yeah, it, let's talk about that really quick. We've got a couple of minutes left, and that's one of the keys, I think, to to marketing a self-published book is, you know, the, the social media aspect, the video, the audio, all of the things that go with it. Uh, how, how much of a social media expert were you before this started, and uh, how much are you now? I, I'm zero. I'm really, <laughs> I don't know social media. And again, my, my business model is I write the books, mm -hmm. my partners do all the social media and everything else. So, right. I'm not a huge social media user. I know it is smidgen, a skosh. So one of the things that we did, and I learned this from Tim Grawl, who wrote a book called Book Launch Blueprint, which is brilliant. Mm -hmm. He's been my guru for this. Um, we created, we took, uh, I, I got a reader's group of people, you know, which has started out to be a dozen. It's grown to 150, 160 now. That's awesome. And I asked them to, t I gave them advanced copies. You've got to be generous, give away books for free, strategically. Mm -hmm. And in exchange, I said, give me what you think are the best quotes in the book, and agree to leave a reader comment when it goes on up on Amazon. They gave me the quotes. We selected out of the book 40 passages we thought were great quotes. We matched them up with beautiful graphics. We created 40 little graphic pictures with the quotes on them and set them up on a website so you can click on it and it brings up, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. They're shareable quotes and we're going to broadcast that widely. So we're going to use social media that way. And that's, you know, what was the cost of that? The cost of the graphics was. So, yeah, well, you know, the, the funny thing, John, is I know this is kind of all new ground to you, but Jesus, you're, you're excited about doing this. Yeah. You, yeah. you sound like you, even though it wasn't something you would initially think about doing, it sounds like you've had a really good time self-publishing. this. I movie. love it. It's a, I'm having a blast <laughs> and it's my, my books are suffering. I have to remember to write those uh, other books. <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, so, so the recipe it comes out, is it October? Yeah. Mid-October. Mid and are there, uh, can people pre-order it now? Is it online somewhere? Yeah, of course, my site, johndavidman.com. Okay. If you go to theingrediencesofgreatness.com, theingrediencesofgreatness.com, okay. there's a whole bonus uh, a pre order offer where you get videos and so forth. Have you guys thought about doing a reality show? 
You, you and uh, Charles in the kitchen, him writing, oh. you cooking or vice Charles versa? Has, Charles has a, uh, has a, a television show in, in development right now. Awesome. Which is, which is tentatively titled The Recipe. And are you uh, participating at all? Are you going to taste test or anything? Probably not. No, it's going to be, it's gonna be uh, <laughs> chef. It's going to be chef uh, interviewing celebrities and, and different, you know, fascinating people about their lives, both their food, their kitchens, and also their recipe for success. Because this is all about the recipe for success. Yep. It, it all gets put together and mixed up and you bake a cake and everybody has yeah. a good time. John it. David Mann, the author of the new book, uh, The Recipe, so many other books. I wanted to talk to you about Brandon Webb, but we're, we're running short of time. Maybe we can do another interview soon. But uh, again, just give those uh, the websites, tell folks how they can go pre-order the book and, uh, and learn more about all of your other books. Yes. So um, my focal point, I, I put everything into my website, which is johndavidmann.com. Okay. I've got a blog I'm active on that. All my books are there. All the books have sample chapters, excerpts, all about you know, background in the book, buy links, the whole schmear. So it's all there on johndavidman.com. Excellent. John, this has been a lot of fun. After we're through here, I want to talk to you about ghostwriting, a book about a, uh, an old guy in Alabama who does YouTube videos. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure there's a lesson. There's a hook in there somewhere. I think there is, yes. All right, John. Hey, man, it's been a pleasure. Appreciate you being on. Likewise. Really, really fun chatting with you. 